This is a vintage Pioneer CTF950 three head cassette deck made in the late 1970s. These decks were some of the most solid decks that Pioneer made. They're very rugged and they have lasted for over 40 years. What we're going to do is I'm going to take you on a tour of the deck and then I'm going to take the top off and take you on a tour of some of the things that I had to do to bring this back to life. This was an e-waste rescue. Made sure that it didn't get sent to the crusher. And it is now in excellent shape. Has a beautiful sound to it. The simulated wood vinyl case is in pretty good condition. There are a few things and I'll, I'll show you where there are some blemishes on it. But what we're going to do is we're going to start by doing a standard tape that we're going to record on. Then we're going to record on a high bias tape. We're also going to record on a metal tape because the CTF 950 supported metal tapes. And finally, just for fun, we're actually going to record on a ferrochrome tape, which ceased production in the mid-1980s, but it does have a ferrochrome setting, so I thought, let's give that one a try as well. When you buy this deck, the, the main tape types I think you're really going to spend uh, your time recording on are going to be just your, your standard tapes and probably your high bias tapes. Even the metal tapes I don't think are worth the bang for the buck, even though you can still get them on eBay, the, uh, the high bias tapes do a great job. So let's jump into this. The deck has several features on it that uh, aren't necessarily evident. Now, of course, you're going to get a reproduction of the user guide, so you'll, you'll be able to follow along just as if you had bought it in 19... Uh, 79 or 1980, but uh, we have the timer uh, play, record, or off, and what that's for is if you have it set to timer play, and let's say you had a timer set up uh, to turn the deck on at a certain time, it would start playing or it would start recording. So I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate that. I've turned the deck off, given it time to to power down. I'm going to turn it on as if a timer had turned it on and then it'll start playing as you can see. One of the other options is timer record. In the 70s and 80s the notion of time shifting wasn't was basically you get a unit like this you get a timer which Pioneer sold their own timers and then you would hook this maybe up to a receiver where you're going to record an FM broadcast and you set it to timer start in record you get everything set up the timer turns on broadcast comes on and it starts recording so since we've started recording let's go ahead and record something from the youtube library and see how that see how that sounds we'll talk about how that looks so Right now, I am recording, and what we're hearing is what's being recorded on the tape at the moment. That's the source, and the source is what's actually coming through, but it's not what's being recorded on the, on the tape. Remember, this has three heads, so it has a record and a playback head, and then there's, of course, the erase head. So, on source, you're just hearing what's coming in to the unit. On tape, you're hearing what's actually being recorded at that time. Now, these units had uh, a couple of things that aren't, aren't typical. One of them was a bias fine adjustment. Now, this is good only when you're recording. If you turn it to the left, it tends to brighten. If you turn it to the right, it tends to make it a little more um, dull or, or not as bright. 
So we're gonna we're gonna try that and see. Pay attention to the counter number because we're going to come back to that so that you can actually hear it. So let's let's listen to what we just recorded. I'm going to let it automatically start at the end. That's another feature that you have. Now we're going to listen to what was recorded. And I'll turn the volume up so you can hear it a little better. Now notice we have Dolby N, and of course this is a standard tape. You do have an output control. Taking Dolby out, you'll hear how Dolby had created the emphasis on the highs. I am recording a little high, a little beyond zero, so anytime you record in the higher range, of course, remember you're going to lose some fidelity. You'll also potentially get distortion. This is about where I was adjusting the bias. Now, because the YouTube library doesn't have, you know, always the best fidelity, I'm going to crank this down a little bit. I'm going to switch back to tape. I was just testing a source. And now I'm going to play another selection so that you get a better idea of some of the fidelity. Now with the YouTube library, of course, you get all kinds of things. This was a very high output recording, so I, I brought the volume down. We're going to go ahead and play this back and see how it sounds. And Now 
now we'll go ahead and play that back. So you probably noticed that you've got much more range even on a uh, recording on a cell phone speaker. You've got much more range on a high bias tape. Now you're going to hear a metal tape. The difference between a metal tape in terms of the, what you're going to hear probably through the, this kind of setup is going to be very minimal and the reason is is that what you get with a metal tape is a much higher high end above 15 kilohertz you do get a quieter sounding tape the metal tapes actually have a, a slightly less or lower uh, tape hiss sound than your other uh, tape types do. But we're going to go ahead and put this into metal and it has to be set to the metal setting and the reason is is that there are two things. One is there's of course the bias uh, which is specific to how that recording is going to be laid onto the tape but the other is that the record head requires much more power to record and race over the metal particle tapes. So we'll go ahead and select the same music and uh, and get this one started again. So I'm going to, and there's a leader here, so I'll get that running. I'm probably going to have to adjust the input. Metal tapes sometimes require a, a different uh, amount of input coming in. It's not anything strange. It's just the way it is. So... Here is, uh, this is Triumph on the Prairie. A little brighter to the left, a little duller to the right. Now let's listen to something else, something a little different, um, because there are some nuances that you might get out of it.
play this back, see how it sounds. I'm pausing this for just a second. Here is where you want to listen for that tape hiss. It's very low. Notice I still have Dolby on, and I forgot to tell you this is just Dolby B. But Dolby is on, and it's still in. It's playing back with its metal bias setting for equalization. So I'm going to start it uh, playing again. Listen for the hiss. I will take Dolby off. I'll also take the equalization off as well so that you can hear it, but it does a pretty good job. So let's go back through a couple of things that we talked about and then I'll record on another tape type. Remember the bias fine adjustment tends to brighten to the left, dull a little bit to the right. On some tapes you don't really see or, or hear that much of a difference. Some tapes you really do. It's just going to depend on the tape that you're using. Every time you record now, there are people who don't like to do this, but I will always use Dolby when I'm recording to make sure that it, it, that highs are emphasized in the same range where tape hiss occurs. We talked about the, the peak, uh, the peak hold and the average view meter settings. It clears it. And we've talked a little bit about some of the memory functions. So now I'm going to record on a ferrochrome tape. Now ferrochrome tapes went um, out of production around 1985. They were supposed to be in between chromium dioxide tapes and ferrochrome and, and, and regular ferric or type 1 tapes. So if you look, uh, a, a normal position tape is called type 1. The chromium dioxide or high bias tapes are type 2. Ferrochrome tapes are type 3, and metal tapes 
good old metal tapes, which took over from about the early 80s. These are type four. That's why you have four types. That's why you have on these decks four different positions that you can choose from. Now we're going to record on a ferrochrome tape. I have FECR selected. I have Dolby in. And I'll adjust the input volume as I need to. One thing you'll notice is the bias fine adjustment has a completely different effect on this kind of tape than it does on any of the other types we've played. Okay, Triumph on the Prairie is what we've been playing. All the way to the left. Big difference, not necessarily a good one. Right in the middle seems to be good. Far right tends to get warm. Let's go ahead and listen to that. And I think you might have noticed how this tended to degrade when we took it to the left. When we went to the right, it got really nice and warm. In the middle was just about right. Notice that's when we took the bias far left. Now you can, as I said, you can still get some of these tapes. I doubt that you'll, you'll purchase them. As I said as well, the best sounding tapes tend to be your high bias tapes. And this just happens to be your Radio Shack HD. It's made by Maxell. Uh, and for every day, your type one tapes. All right, now we're going to take the top off and we're going to take a tour of some of the things that uh, I had to do to um, save this from e-waste and I'll go handheld when I do that. Okay, some of the things that uh, we always do with these decks is we inspect the pinch rollers and almost all the time have to replace them. So this is a special order pinch roller. You'll notice it's not black. I don't buy them anymore. I've found a, a better source. There's nothing wrong with those. It's very nice, but they're also very expensive. I replace the right pinch roller with uh, just an industry standard pinch roller. I clean the heads, of course, and I do do an azimuth setting. Um, and I talk about that in my um, listing, but essentially I use um, 
alignment tapes to do it. Um, all of the knobs have been polished up, cleaned up. You really don't have a lot of uh, issues on the face of this deck. It looks, it looks pretty good. The corners are in good shape. Uh, the, the whole face of it looks really pretty good. I think you've got a small blemish here or there, and I'll take some more detailed pictures in the listing so that you really have a good idea of what you're, what you're getting. So let's take a look inside. I always replace all of the belts and the idler tire. I do some basic tune-up on the mechanism, and I always rebuild the rewind motor. The rewind motor always needs to be rebuilt. And even if I get one that seems to be in good shape, I go ahead and rebuild it because 40 years of rewinding tapes has left a lot of dirt on the armature. So that gets all cleaned up. I don't do that with the drive motor. These tend to be in really good shape. So the ones that I have taken apart didn't need it. So I, what I will do with these is I do a speed adjust, adjust, adjustment to make sure that, that it is tracking it on a three kilohertz tone properly. Um, the control board, occasionally I have to replace this capacitor. That capacitor governs when you're doing rewind, when it senses the end of the tape so that it'll stop trying to rewind. Um, uh, those almost always need to be replaced. Most of the rest of them are fine. I don't replace capacitors on the power board primarily because when I have pulled them, they've been better spec than something brand new from China. So um, unless I need to, I don't I don't uh, uh, do anything to the power board. Now, if I have to do something on the power supply, any surrounding capacitors I'll test, and usually if I take it out and test it, I'll replace it with a brand new one. These were really good capacitors that uh, Pioneer used at the time. And what I've done is I've purchased uh, audio grade um, capacitors. Now notice when I say I've replaced the capacitors, I've replaced the electrolytic capacitors. I have not replaced disc capacitors, which don't need it, or any of the other capacitors, unless I've found a problem in the circuit and, has, and it's been required. But you'll notice they've been replaced on the riser boards, on the record board, um, and throughout the, the motherboard. You'll also notice that I've set some of the potentiometers. You'll see some little dots that I've drawn on the board. And some potentiometers I've changed a little bit to bring them into spec with the oscilloscope. Other than that, um, and for those of you who, who do know about these, the bias uh, management is here and here. That has to be done with a scope. So that's the that's mostly what was what was done on the inside of this unit. Um, but the the display board is in pretty good shape. Uh, as I said, I had to I had to replace a couple of components on it. But uh, for the most part, it's in good shape. The uh, Let's kind of turn this around so that you can see what the serial number is on the unit that, uh, that you're buying. And I, I do this specifically so that y you're not, so, so you know what you're buying. And so there's, there's a serial number right there. I also put, uh, I put two stickers, I've, I've only got one sticker on right now, but I put two stickers on which describe the maintenance that's been done to the unit. And that's it for a tour of the electronics. That's it for a tour of the electronics. What I'm going to do next is take you on a tour of the case, and I want to talk to you a little bit about what it, the condition it's in. So here is the case. Now these, I've actually seen the, the nice real wood veneer. This is a, uh, this is um, vinyl. 
veneer, but it looks pretty good. It's in pretty good shape. You will notice some, some minor flaws to it. And I'm doing this because I want you to see as much as you can before you get, before you get this home. But you can see it looks pretty good. However, there are a couple of blemishes that I can't really do too much about. That's one of them. You've got a little bit of a cracked veneer there. And what I did do was I did make sure it was glued and wasn't coming, wasn't coming off, but there's not a whole lot you can do with that. You could cut it off. And if you had another one, uh, place it on there and, and merge it in. That's hard to do. You also have this little bit of a chip here on the front. And got a little bit of a scratch there. Can't do, you could probably fill it in or color it. I didn't do anything with it. The side looks pretty good. And then the actual sides are in pretty good shape. You'll notice the corners look pretty good. The edge looks pretty good. These look pretty good on the side. I'll take you on the other side. So from a from a case standpoint, this is in pretty good condition. This will this will be marked for the serial number so that um, in the event, and this this has happened, not to me but to other people, um, where someone has purchased a unit. I'm just trying to make sure I can get the best for you so you can actually see it. Um, I've had situations. I haven't. Uh, other people have had situations where. Um, they have sold a unit and someone has opened up a, a grievance with eBay and they returned the unit and they didn't get the, the same uh, case top that they had sent off. So we want to make sure everybody is honest in these dealings. And this is an addendum. I wanted you to be able to see the a little bit of the markings that were on the case top because this won't really show up in the pictures very well. And I'm doing this again to make sure that when you get it, as much as I could possibly disclose has been disclosed. Again, remember, this was saved from e-waste.